Welcome to this book launch. And this you see here is a, the first biography of Edmund of Cornwall. And I, for those of you unfamiliar with Edmund, I'm just gonna read the title to you here. Edward I Regent, Edmund of Cornwall, the man behind England's greatest king. Mm -hmm. So now the author is Michael Ray and we're gonna be talking to him a little bit later about both his book and his medieval studies. But before that, I wanna give you a little background to this launch. So um, basically Edmund is the son of Richard of Cornwall. And there was supposed to be a biography of Richard as well at this time. Uh, I know that because I wrote it. My name is Darren Baker. And the original intention was for Michael and me to go to Berkhamsted with our books and do the launch there on this very day. So why Berkhamsted and why the 2nd of April? As it turns out, it is a milestone anniversary. It was 750 years ago on this day that Richard of Cornwall died at Berkhamsted and his son Edmund became the new Earl of Cornwall. So it's a perfect opportunity to do a book launch for both of them. Unfortunately, we encountered a couple of snags. First, we did not score the uh, venue we were hoping to have at Berkhamsted. And second, uh, <laughs> it's the situation with my book. Um, maybe I can describe it like this. You ever see that movie where a movie producer tells a director, hey, I got a great idea for a movie. And the director says, oh, really? Do you have a script? And the producer says, no, but I have a poster. Well, that's my situation. I have a jacket for my book, there you see, but no book to go with it. Um, the publisher decided for whatever reason to hold it off till September. So catch up with me then, then we can uh, do another launch. So um, doesn't matter. Uh, right now we're gonna go uh, talk to Michael a bit about himself and then we're gonna do the actual launch of the book, the ceremony part. So Michael, good evening, how are you? I'm well, I'm well, thank you, Darren. All right, so uh, can you tell us where are you coming to us from right now? Well, I'm in a village called Patcham, which was a downland village in Sussex, which was in the 1920s was overwhelmed by the coastal town of Brighton. So I'm about three miles from the sea and about eight miles from Lewis, which is the county town of East Sussex. Oh, OK. And but are you from Sussex or where are you from? No, I was born in Chester just before the war. And as soon as the war broke out, we rushed to stay with my grandfather who lived in Aintree in Liverpool. And I spent the war years in, in Liverpool. Oh, and do you have any memories of the war? Well, I think the main one, the visual ones, are really uh, related to the River Mersey. I can remember ships that had been bombed gradually sinking day by day, as you saw them uh, in the river. And also, I remember one day we went to see the first captured German U-boat was brought into Liverpool. I think they're my main visual memories. Oh, OK, so Liverpool. Now, does that mean, see, Liverpool after the war. That means you sort of ran around with Paul McCartney, George Harrison in that crowd? I'm a bit older than them. <laughs> okay, so if I want to pitch an idea for a Henry III musical to Paul McCartney, you're not the person to go to. Oh, that. no, definitely not, no. Well, so how, how did you get involved into, in medieval studies? Well, I went to school in Shropshire for um, 12 years, and then I went to King's College London where I read geography with history as a subsidiary, but I did history very much as the modern history. Uh, and then I did a town planning diploma, and as part of that, I had to do a thesis. And I read this paper by a man called T.F. Tout, you're the famous administrative historian on medieval town planning. And that interested me, and also, I found out that many of the people involved with the town planning of Edward I in particular came from a, a part of Switzerland where my grandfather, my paternal grandfather had come from. So that really stimulated my interest in it. And I did my planning thesis on medieval Bastide towns. Well, there you go. Wow. So, and how long, or when did this all start? Like, uh... 
that was uh, 1960, I graduated, 64, I got my diploma. And then I went into town planning and I, I worked into town planning until actually yesterday was the 25th anniversary of my retirement. Oh, you, you've been retired for a quarter of a century? Yeah. That's the dream. Oh, well, it was hey. beautiful weather then, not as cold as it is today. <laughs> and then I went uh, that autumn, I went back to King's College and signed up under the um, amazingly wonderful David Carpenter to do medieval history. I had to do the MA first because I needed to brush up on my O-level Latin and learn paleography. So I did the MA first and then I did the PhD following that. Well, great. Um, now what we're going to do is the actual ceremony of the launch. So I am based in the Czech Republic. And here, when you launch a book, it's a little bit like launching a ship, which means that you open a bottle of sparkling. Now, I'm not going to like crash it over the book, but just open it. And then I'm going to pour it on the book a little bit like a baptism. So um, I have with me here Bohemian sect, if you can see it there. Um, for those of you not so familiar with Czech geography, Bohemia is that way. Lots of nice things to see. They got a city called Prague and stuff like that. I'm based in Moravia. So now I have a stainless steel mixing bowl. This will be the font. Let's put that there. Got the book. So now I'm going to pop the bubbly here. Let's hope it doesn't end up in my neighbor's flat. Let's see. All right. Okay, no mess. Got the cork even. So, got the book. I put the book in the font so everyone can see it. All right. Let me get, my out, let me get some position here. So, some appropriate words. I hereby christen thee Edward the First Regent, the Edmund of Cornwall, the man behind England's greatest king. There we go. Michael, your book's all christened, ready to sail. I'm just going to put it over here to dry out a bit. <laughs> and while I do that, I'm going to pour glass. And there. So I want to raise my glass to you, not only for your book, which fills an, uh, an important gap in medieval studies. It's really, really a good book but also for your previous work. Um, for those of you who don't know, Michael did a lot of excellent research on the, the issue of aliens in England in the 13th century. Now, it's a very contentious issue. I, for one, believe they had a positive effect, but a lot of people will disagree. Whether you agree or disagree, your opinion is not gonna be very informed unless you consult Michael's work first. So to you, I say, salut. <laughs> Okay, so um, I, ought, I ought to I ought to say, Darren, that if you're talking about the aliens, one of our participants is the man whose shoulders I stood on, Hugh Ridgway, who is oh, yes, really yes, the pioneer yes, yes, of yes, studies yes, of the aliens in the 13th century. And it was interesting because we had a hostile environment to aliens then, and now we have a hostile environment to aliens run by Pretty Patel, who is of alien origin okay, okay, well. they had one run by simon de mumford who was an alien yeah, well. well anyway we will uh like i said people it's a it's an issue that's um just waiting to be um discovered so um now we've gone through the launch and um what we're going to do now michael and i have a kind of a slideshow prepared so we're going to talk about some it's about 20 slides or so that relate to Edmund's life. And then after that, we're going to take a quick break, about five minutes. I will leave up a map on the screen with Edmund's uh, timeline and, and stuff like that. And then when we come back from this break, we're going to do a Q&A. So if you have questions for Michael, you have anything you want to say to him or even to me for that matter, it's going to be done in a personal style. That means microphones on and everybody can say what they like, except please, let's probably know uh, <laughs> politics, yeah. So uh, first of all, let's get a our screen going here. And so now this is to start here. Um, 
it's better to go with the family. So Michael, who are these people? Well, the one at the top, of course, is King John. And then underneath that, you see- King John on, here, yeah. Mm -hmm. You see on, on the left-hand side of my screen, you see his two sons, Henry, who became Henry III, King of England. Yeah. Richard of Cornwall, who became King of the Romans, King of Germany. Mm -hmm. And then you see two sisters. One, Isabella, who became the Empress of, of the Empress, Holy Roman yeah. Empress. And on the other side, you see Joanna, the Queen of Scotland. That's and Joanna. in the middle is Eleanor, who married uh, as a second husband, Simon de Montfort. Okay, there's Eleanor. Great. So those are the five, let's say, legitimate children of King John. Henry became king. His children are further down on the roll. So let's talk about these two here, these two children of of Richard here. So who is the eldest here? Well, uh, the first one by his first wife is Henry of Almain. Almain being of Germany, of course, because of uh, his uh, title as King of, the, of Germany. Uh, he was 14 years older than his second son, Edmund, there's the second one along, who was the son of Sanchia of Provence. Okay, so that's see, Edmund here. Uh, what was the age? So they were half brothers. What was the age four, difference? 14 years them? difference. 14 years. 14 years difference. Okay. So, and then, and you, then you see the Montforts. Right. So, why, why didn't Henry of Almain become the next Earl of Cornwall? Because he was murdered by two of the Montforts, two of his ah, cousins. That's right. So, uh, these hoodlums here, they did in Henry of Almain. So that left Edmund the sole heir to Richard. Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit about that scandal because it really was that. So let's move on. And what do we have here? This is Berkhamsted Castle, where Edmund was born the day after Christmas in 1249. It's also where his mother died and his father died. And it's a vast castle about 30 miles north of London. You can see it very well from the railway line, but it's well worth a visit. Okay, and um, so uh, Sanchia died there. Uh, how, how old was she, do you know? Or... I think she was 36 when she died. 36 or so, okay, so she was there. Well, yeah, well, let's, let's go right into that now. So these, uh, I should explain to everyone. Now, these two statues are at Meissen Cathedral, which is just uh, northwest of Dresden in Germany. It's long held believed that this that they represent Otto the Great and his wife Adelaide, um, and the cathedral still swears by today. But I believe there's enough compelling evidence to suggest that it's in fact Richard of Cornwall and Sanchia. But anyway, we won't get into that now. So, Michael, tell us a little bit about Sanchia. Well, Sanchia was a, a, an, an amazing family. She came from the. Count of Provence was married to the daughter of the Count of Savoy, and they had four daughters, no sons, four daughters. The eldest one, Margaret, married King Louis IX of, of France, Saint Louis. The second one, Eleanor, married Henry III, King of England. The third one, who was Sanchia, married Richard of Cornwall. And the fourth one, Beatrice, married Charles of Anjou, who later became King of Naples. Right, so, so these, four, these are the four, four fabled queens, right? The sisters. Four queens, yeah. Right. Oh, okay, so. So Edmund, Edmund had exactly the same gene pool as his cousin Edward I. Okay, yeah. So, so those were the four fabled sister queens of Provence. Now, who is this lady? Is she one of them? No, that's the second wife, the third wife, sorry, of Richard. Is when Sanchia died, when she was 36, um, when uh, I think it's partly Richard trying to establish himself more in Germany, he marries this very young aristocrat, about 15, related to the uh, Archbishop of Cologne, Beatrice von Falkenberg. She was about 15, he was about 60. And um, <laughs> this is a stained glass window, which actually from this weekend you can see again because it's part of the Burrow collection in Glasgow. So uh, Beatrix was Edmund's stepmother. Yes. And how, and how did they get along? All right, or? Well, when she married, uh, both Edmund and his elder brother, Henry was still alive, and she signed an agreement that she wouldn't encroach on their rights. In other words, normally when um, he became a widow, 
in the, this period, according to Magna Carta, you're entitled to a third of your husband's lands. Well, she signed away those rights. Uh, and when, when Richard died, she uh, instituted a number of cases against Edmund to try and get more land. But it didn't last very long because she died when she was only 23, 24. All right. And uh, yeah, so she stayed behind in England. She died yeah. there. And, and Edmund basically just he got the whole shebang. She right. Died okay. in Oxford. All right. So now um, I should explain this picture. This is Lewis. And this is quite near to where Michael lives, just up, up from the coast. And the reason why it's important is that a major battle took place here in 1264 when uh, Simon de Montfort's uh, rebel forces defeated uh henry the third so basically henry and richard would have come out of the priory here edward from the castle here simon had his troops up on the high ground so probably the battle took place somewhere there um i believe that the royalists would have won had edward not gone on his catastrophic joyride uh but at any rate simon threw in his reserves pushed them back and now Richard and Edmund being in the middle, they sort of ran or <laughs> they took flight this way and uh, they took refuge in a, a windmill, right, Michael? Yes, and they were captured in the windmill. Um, and uh, from that, um, there's, there's actually a plaque up marking the site of the windmill uh, very near the county hall in Lewis. Yeah, so and then following that, they were imprisoned, first of all, in the Tower of London. Then they were moved to Wallingford. Where all the right, Lord great. We, we have a, a slide here. This is a model of Wallingford. So they're in the Tower of London first. Then they were yeah. moved to Wallingford. And Wallingford was actually a castle that belonged to Richard of Cornwall, Edmund's father. And according to Robert of Gloucester, the Queen urged a rescue mission. So a party set off from Bristol, which was one of Ed, Lord Edward's bases, 300 cavalrymen and a thousand foot soldiers, and they broke into the castle and were uh, getting pretty near conquering it. And yet the garrison let it be known that if they wanted Edward, they could have him, but they sling him over the wall on a mangonel. Yeah. And at that, <laughs> Edward said, please lads, go away. And they went away. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I think th they got uh, actually inside the inner yes, courtyard here or did, somewhere yes. there. So they probably had Edward up here and like, hey, yeah. guys, get out of here or else. OK, so. All right. So, so so rising from that, of course, mm -hmm. Montfort was very annoyed about this and had um, them move to his great castle at Kenilworth, where they were in prison for the rest of the wars until after uh, the death of Simon. So this is the this is Kenilworth Castle. And I think you say that this this yeah, red this, sky was an omen of the Battle of uh, Evesham. <laughs> well, th this sky is actually more or less manufactured, but it, I wanted to represent the fact that there was a comet, a great comet in the sky at the time. And so the prisoners would have observed it every morning, I think between July and September. And it was Robert of Gloucester and a few others who who saw this comet that it had a fiery red tail and they, they saw it as a portent for more, more bloodshed to come, which of course, within a year would be the Battle of Evesham and <laughs> they didn't get bloodier than that. All right, and what is this we see here? That is Trefeld's castle in the Palatinate in Germany, which is where the Imperial treasury was kept. And, uh, Edmund went to Germany on probably three occasions with his father. And on the last occasion, he came back with a holy blood relic from here. Why it was him rather than his father, I don't know, because he was only about 18 at the time. So he brought this relic of the holy, holy blood back and gave it to his father's new foundation, the vast Hales Abbey in Gloucestershire. Yeah, I, I have some inside information from Germany where uh, Richard of Cornwall is popular because he was the king of Germany, that the, there's a certain belief that Edmund stole it <laughs> from, from Trefels, but uh, wow, we, we, we can't uh, know one way or the other. Uh, but uh, the issue of the Holy Blood was, was very important, so we have this image here. Well, that, that is not, um, that's not Edmund, but that is Henry III with another holy blood relic, which he's taking in procession to his beloved 
Westminster Abbey. And the interesting thing is that it, it never seems quite as popular in Westminster Abbey as the one at Hales. Hales, of course, is, uh, if you go there, it's, you can make a, a reasonable lengthy pilgrimage, whereas this, of course, is in adjoining the capital city of the realm. So uh, there's also some, uh, I think Nick Vincent has written about this and suggested that it's possible it wasn't quite so popular because its um, provenance was somewhat less uh, persuasive than the well, Hales Holy Blood Relic. I, I'm not so sure about that because I mean, Henry had Robert Grossetes, he, he verified it or to some extent, I, I just would think that you know, if, if you save up your pennies for a pilgrimage, you're not going to go to London. It, it's grimy, it's dirty, the, the, it's only a works area around the cathedral. You could get robbed there, and then you say, oh, well, I went to London. You know, well, okay, it's expensive and everything. But if you go to Gloucestershire, I mean, nice countryside, serenity and all. But anyway, we can talk about that forever. So Henry is presenting this blood at Westminster Abbey about 20 years before Edmund acquired his, how shall we say, copy. And, and so what did Ed, Edmund do with it? He gave it to Hales Abbey. Hales, and did some go to Ashridge as well? I think a bit did, uh, but Ashridge is much later, of course. Ashridge okay, is in yeah. the 1280s. All right, so now, now Edmund, was at Trefoils in 1268, 1269. He came home to England with his father. Now, the next big event in his life happens here. Yes, this is the Church of San Silvestro in Viterbo. What happened is Edmund went with the Lord Edward and his half-brother Henry to join the crusade of Louis IX. They went all the way to Tunis, but by the time they got to Tunis, the King of France, Louis, had died. So they were, um, I think they were part of the party escorting his body back to France. And they stopped on the way at Viterbo, where there was a, a conclave going on. And in this church here, um, Henry went to mass and was dragged out by the two Montford brothers and stabbed to death. Yeah, we have an image of it from Villani's Chronicle. So I guess that's, that's Guy de Montford here. Um, it, it actually, it, it was quite violent. Uh, the reports yes. say that two of the priests tried to intervene. One of them was killed. Uh, Henry was dragged out amongst the congregation and finished off on the square. So do you think Edmund was present at this? I think he moment? must have been. I think he would have been traveling with his brother. Yeah. So I think he must have been there. Well, of course, it changed the course of history, really, because Henry of Almain, from what we know of him, he, he was a quite dynamic young individual. He's about, I guess, what, 35 or so at the time. He had just made a very advantageous marriage to the uh, heiress, to the Count of Baron, and also he was the only uh, victor in the, the War of the Disinherited. He defeated the rebels at, uh, where was it, Chesterfield, and he, he went I think uh, Henry III and, and Edward had a lot of trust in him. So he could have been a very dynamic uh, character in Edward's reign, but he's gone and now Edmund is his father's heir. So what are these coat of arms we see here? Well, as you said right at the beginning, what happened is that in uh, two, um, 750 years ago today, Richard of Cornwall dies. And he leaves, leaves all his lands go to his young son, Edmund. Edmund is not married, he's not knighted, he's not the Earl, but he's in need of a wife. So you look around to see where you might find a wife from, and you look around the European courts, bearing in mind that all his blood is of royal blood, and there isn't really anybody suitable, so he has to look for an English wife. On the left-hand side are the arms of the Earl de Cornwall. The yellow bezants, by the way, in the Bordeaux are very much a symbol of Cornwall. On the right hand side are the air arms of Clare. What happened is that uh, Edmund married Margaret de, de Clare. She was ab about the same age as him, and she was about 21, 22, which I've always thought was a bit odd. She, she was still around at that time, sister of the Earl of Gloucester. Her two sisters have both married at the age of 17 or 18. So I wonder a bit whether she was somewhat on the shelf. Anyhow, they married at Ryslip in 1272. 
And so uh, on um, Edward the Confessor's day, um, which was of course one of the favorite days of Henry III, uh, Edmund was knighted and also allowed to become Earl of Cornwall. Okay, so, um, all right, now, this fellow here is Edward the First. Now you mentioned that Edward's father and Edmund's father were brothers, uh, their mothers were sisters, so they were sort of double first cousins, yeah? Yes, yeah, so as I say, they had exactly the same genes. And so what, what was the role that Edmund played in Edward's reign? Well, he, he was extremely supportive. I mean, one, one thing that we haven't mentioned yet, he was one of the most, uh, he was the richest man in England. Um, well, of course, the king got more income than him, but the king had to spend his income on, on ruling, on building castles, etc. Whereas Edmund's uh, income, he could do what he liked with it. And one of the things he did do was to lend considerable sums of money to the king. Um, in today's currency, uh, he lent at least 17 and a half million pounds to the king. Um, so that was one way he supported him. But the other way, he, he took part in the first Welsh war. He had um, the largest number of knights on that, but he didn't serve on any, any of the other campaigns. Instead, he sort of in the second Welsh war, he rather looked after the shop. And then when Edward went to Gascony for three years, Edmund was the regent of England for those three years. And, and I you, think he you... looked after it fairly well. Some historians are a bit sniffy about him, but I think he did a pretty good job. Well, if you think he's ruling England basically at the top for three years, he, he must have been doing something right. Well, he, he, was, he was ruling England and doing it at his advantage because all the top bureaucrats, all the top civil servants, etc., had gone with Ed, Edward to Gascony. Um, mm -hmm. But he did face a major rebellion in Wales from Rhys Ap Meredith in South Wales, which was really quite difficult. And I think he, he the way he conducted himself in putting this down, uh, he deserves more credit than he's been given by other historians. Okay, and uh, so we see a picture here. This is Edward and this is Edmund, the double first cousins. I'm um, not sure if we can see much similarities from uh, this, but um, uh, what? It was about 10 years age difference between them, right? Uh, 39 and yes, 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 39 and 40. And, yeah. and Edward had, I believe, as many as 15 or 16 children, yeah. but Edmund had none, right? No, well, he had none that survived. Uh, we know that in uh, when Margaret Clare was 36, the Bishop of Winchester wrote and said he couldn't come to an event because he'd promised the, the Countess of Cornwall that he'd go to her for her lying in. So she must have been pregnant at least once. Um, but soon after that, the marriage crumbled. And after a, a long and uh, disputatious uh, period, including interventions by the Archbishop of Canterbury on Margaret's side, uh, finally a not exactly a divorce settlement, a separation was agreed in 1294. Okay, so, uh, and he, so this is, uh, what is this here? This is what is now Ashridge. Um, as you can tell from the, the business of acquiring the Holy Blood Relic, as you may not know, he rebuilt Hales Abbey after it was badly damaged by fire. But he also founded two new institutions, Ruley uh, Abbey in Oxfordshire, and this new order called the Bonhams at Ashridge, which is a few miles north of Berkhamstead. And he had this considerable building there. It was big enough to house the king staying there in his first Christmas of his, as a widower. And a parliament was held there for the whole of January 1291. The buildings itself were extended over the years, but in 1813 they were demolished by the Earl of Bridgewater, who built this vast neo-Gothic building on its site, which is, it remains today. All right. So basically, Edmund was remembered mostly for Hales and Ashridge. So he died at Ashridge, correct? Yes, he did. So, um, but he was buried at Hales. His heart was buried at Ashridge, okay. and he, he was a big fan of saints. I mean, he was named after Edmund Rich, 
the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was made a saint in the, that century, he bought his place where he was born and built a chapel on his site. And he was also a big friend of Thomas Cantaloupe, who later became Saint Thomas Cantaloupe, the Bishop of Hereford. And when Cantaloupe died abroad, Archbishop Peckham, the awkward Archbishop of Canterbury, who came from Patcham, for instance, where I lived, um, was very awkward about his, him being buried in Hereford. And so um, Edmund got hold of his heart and his heart was buried in Ashridge alongside that of Edmund. Later, Edmund's heart later joined him at Ashridge. But uh, Edmund himself was taken to our... His, to Hales, yes, which, is where his, which is where his father, his mother okay. and his half-brother were all buried. Okay, so we can look here. So these... These are the, uh, the ruins, the foundation of Hales. So this would have been the shrine of the holy blood. Here would have been the, the, the high altar. And probably this point here is where Henry of Almain was buried after the, uh, the Montfort brothers did him in. And so Richard, Sancha, and Edmund were all probably interred here on the left side. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, so uh, what about this final piece we can see here? What is that? Well, in the museum at Hales, this uh, bit of statuary is said to be part of the effigy of Edmund of Cornwall, but I don't really know how they uh, prove it or how what provenance it is. But I, I've included in my book as just um, a claim. Okay, so now you were telling us that Edmund was one of the richest men in England. So can you give us an idea of his wealth? Well, I think one of the important things about him is you remember, you have to remember that his wealth was private wealth. The king had more income, but the king had to spend money on governing the country. I mean, for, for instance, Edward I had to spend a, a fortune on building all the castles in North Wales. Edmund mm. could do what he liked with his money. Uh, Nick Vincent has suggested he had an income of about £8,000 a year, which is nearly £6 million equivalent today. And I think that's an underestimate because it's taken from a series of account books that uh, survived and also his profits from the tin industry in Cornwall and, and Devon. But it doesn't include, for instance, he had over 100 wardships. And if you had a wardship, you took the, the profits of that while the young heir was still uh, coming uh, before he came of age. You could sell the wardship on, you could sell the marriages on. He, well, he, he, for instance, he was able to lend the, he lent the king in the equivalent of today's money, 17 and a half million pounds. And he lent to private citizens, the equivalent of 10.6 million pounds. And of course, in the accounts, there's nothing shown about these being repaid. Now, we know he had a treasurer because his treasurer was murdered in the streets in London. So there must have been some overall accounting mechanism rather than these individual honours uh, that we do have some records from. Right. And so you said, was, you said how many properties, sorry, how many properties did he own? He, he had 800 properties in 27 counties. And as I say, 13 castles, one of which Castle Holgate in South Shropshire, he sold to Robert Burnell the treasurer of Edward I, who was a Shropshire man himself. So, okay. you know, he had castles right across the country, as far north as Knaresborough, and then down to the, to the southwest. Okay. There are two forests, he had Dartmoor and Knaresborough, and he had at least 38 parks to go hunting in. So he, he wasn't <laughs> He had 38 parks? <laughs> yeah, and when he did this uh, separation with his wife, she was given lands worth 800 pounds a year, which was a heck of a lot of money, particularly she must have been one of the richest men in England. But if he was worth 8,000 pounds a year, he got away with it pretty lightly. You know, he, 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 he was pretty wealthy and he, uh, he, he made um, over 70 benefactions to religious houses, 43 different houses or orders of dioceses. So yeah. I think there's no doubt that he, wa he was a, a man of uh, considerable piety. Well, anyway, okay, so um, I think that gives us a very good idea about Edmund. Um, again, uh, I think your book is, is making a great contribution to our 
understanding of this era. So let's open it up to any questions anyone has. Well, Michael, can I start off by saying, I think looking forward very much to receiving the book here and uh, reading it. Um, I did have a, a question, which is really just how you um, really became interested in Edmund in the, in the first place. Well, David, as you know, I did all this work on aliens and I followed that up with a number of uh, papers based on that. And uh, I was particularly in love with the Savoyards. And then I thought I'd like to tackle a, a major subject. Uh, and I thought no one ever says much about Edmund, but he was, he, you know, the cousin of the king, same blood group as the king. Why doesn't anybody say very much about him? So it took me about three years to do the research and so on. And um, I finished almost 10 years ago, and then I was struck down with um, age-related macular degeneration, which was rather delayed things. And it was only from Darren's suggestion that I actually found a publisher in the end. Mm -hmm. Michael, can I ask you a question? Um, can you hear me? Yes, I tremble that you're asking me a question. Uh, no. <laughs> to me, you're the no, founder no, no. of all wisdom. I, I, I was just very, very interested to know, um, I mean, wh why do you think he he promoted the cult of Thomas Cantilupe so much? I uh, he was very really instrumental know. in getting um, him canonised, wasn't he? Yes, I, I. he seemed to be very interested. I mean, you know, and he was keen on Edmund Rich too. Um, and one of the interesting things is why on earth did he introduce this new order, the Bonhoms, into England? Who gave him the idea of doing that? And I wonder whether Cantaloupe was behind that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, 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 a Victorian lady novelist who wrote this book called something like um, Not For Him, A Forgotten Hero. And she goes to town. It, it's a, it's a, a story about Edmund of Cornwall. And she sees him as something wonderful. And the reason she thinks of him as wonderful is she identifies the Bonhams as early Protestants. So, you know, she's full of admiration for him because of that. Where, where were the Bonhams from? Were they from South France or somewhere about there? I think they're meant to be from, from Provence or somewhere like that. Though I think there was only one other Bonhomme house in England, wasn't it? Eddington in Wiltshire, is it? Uh, and, so they weren't. And, and were, they, were they called the Blue Friars? Yes, I think sometimes they were called the Blue Friars. Yes, and he also founded, a, refounded a college at Wallingford Castle. So you know, he he really did put it around a lot. One of the things that interested me was that um, was one of the reasons he was so um, generous to religious uh, um, institutions is he knew he wasn't going to have children, and the you know the thing would go mm -hmm. to his cousin Edward the first. And I also wonder whether you could look at a, on a timeline to see whether the breakdown of his marriage had anything to do with it until, you know, that happened. He thought he might have children and therefore husband his resources a bit more. And after that, when he knew the marriage had broken up, he went for broke. But I, I, I don't, I've done a timeline on it. I don't think it proves that he was um, any more uh, generous before or after the separation of his marriage. Yeah, his, his marriage broke up about during the Regency, didn't it, around then? Just after the Regency, after. Yes. So do you think maybe there were some pressures there, or...? I wouldn't have thought so. I mean, one of the... One of the um, this Emily Holter wrote this novel, suggested that Margaret de Clare was a spiteful, icy, horrible woman. Of okay. course, the Clares had a reputation for hot temper, didn't they? they wasn't Gilbert de Clare called the Red Earl? Red. <laughs> well, there, there was Bogo too, the younger yes. pluralist brother. Yes. You know, and he, he got, him. he intervened in the separation. He tried to slap a, a, a sort of a, a warrant on Edmund as he crossed the, the Westminster Hall for Parliament. And this was regarded as contempt of Parliament and there were huge fines issued because of that. I, he, I, I remember reading in the in the patent roll somewhere where Bogo was identified as Bozo, and I thought that was quite appropriate. I've got a feeling he had his first clerical position when he was seven. Is that possible? Yeah, I I, I read so he he had collected as many as, as twenty or twenty five. But it should be said that Thomas Cantaloupe also he had about ten, yeah. and his uncle Walter was very big on that issue as well. So, you know, they all had their hands in the pie, let's say. So, <laughs> so Michael Baricki, is that correct? 
It's Pardon? Beritsky. That's as close as it gets, though, Dan. Beritsky. Thank you. Okay, so welcome. You have a question for Michael. Thank you. Course. Yeah, Michael, as I said in personal correspondence with you, your study was oh, yes. uh, crucial to yeah. me completing my own master's dissertation. So I, I wanted to thank you for that. And Louise Wilkinson was great in pointing me towards that study. Um, what I wanted to ask you was about the relationship, the personal relationship between Edward and Edmund. Um, in your study, you mentioned, well, first it's a time period where diaries and, and personal thoughts aren't necessarily recorded. So a lot of it is up to speculation and just looking at the evidence we have. Um, gifts from Edward to Edmund, such as deer, which you point out in your study, and you just mentioned, Edmund had 38 parks to hunt from. He, he wasn't short of deer, so he, that's a clear, he, he a clear need, gift. He didn't need gifts, did he? No, he didn't. So the fact that those gifts are given and recorded shows that there clearly was some affection uh, or appreciation, at least, between the king and his earl. And perhaps most importantly is at Edward's maybe lowest time in his life when his queen dies in November of 1290. Yeah. Um, and he, he's so distraught, you know, the Eleanor crosses. Um, mm -hmm. His first Christmas time alone, he yes. doesn't spend it in London. He goes to Ashridge and, and he yes. spends yeah. it with his cousin. He, so, he, he's there for a good month, I think. Right. And like you said, Parliament's there in January. So, so how do you see, just on the evidence that we have, how do you see the evidence? Um, um, how do you see the relationship between think, Edward I, and his king? I think it's pretty good. I, he's, he knows he's reliable. For instance, on the Second Welsh War, um, Edmund doesn't come on it. I think he stays in London sort of running things there. there I think there's one little um, flare up. Uh, during the, the, the Welsh Rebellion, uh, I think at one time, um, the king was persuaded that uh, Edmund hadn't made sure that the uh, some of the Welsh castles were garrisoned well enough. And he was defended by, amongst other people, the Alan of Castile. So that seemed to have been um, overcome quite quickly. So I think he was regarded as a pretty solid, reliable man. And Edward I was very lucky in that, wasn't he? Because his own brother, Edmund of Lancaster, was very uh, supportive too. Yeah. So um, it yeah. may reflect- Very important that point that Ed Edward had a lot of support from his family. Yeah. Even his parents, when he was a wild teenager, we can we can also add. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, sorry. Uh, so Hugh, Hugh Ridgeway, right? Nice to meet you finally. And you too. Yes. Thank we, you. We've been Thank in, we've been in really correspondence good. for several years, but never met. <laughs> yes. Well, such is life. Yeah, yeah, well, but I, I thank you very much for uh, reading drafts of my books and stuff and commenting on them because it's very oh, important to me. Well, it was a great honor to be asked to do it. Thank you. I'm now my, well, I have a Richard of Cornwall in the works. It's actually finished, but as I explained earlier, it's been delayed. But uh, I have to say that that one probably gave me I have to say the greatest joy. Maybe I felt myself more mature in the subject, or but Richard turned out to be quite a character. I mean, I I had always saw him as sort of a, a shallow sort, you know, but you know because of the windmill and the songs and stuff like that and the girls and the money. But he's he's actually I I I am of the opinion had he been given the imperial dignity, he would have made a, a great success of it. That's that's my feeling there. Oh. I, I should tell everyone, you know, there is a book on Richard of Cornwall out now. It's called Richard von Cornwall, and it's, well, it's in German. Um, there is a, uh, a scholar in Weimar who, who is uh, very much interested in this period, and um, he's going to release it in English a little bit later. It's not an actual biography. It's more like a, a retelling of the events of the 13th century with Richard at the center of it. But, uh, you know, the only English king of Germany, I think he's gaining in popularity there. Well, my, could I ask one more question, uh, Michael? Was he a generous lord? I mean, and what, what's the evidence for how he rewarded his entourage? And indeed, what's the evidence for the nature of his uh, affinity? Well, I, I go into some detail on that. And it, it, indeed, the initial book was a lot longer than that. And I published some of the extra stuff on the Academia website, including the appendix on this. And I get the impression he was he got on fairly well with his affinity. One or two of them left and went to serve other people like bishops and so on. 
but he had a solid group of people from Cornwall, also a group of people from the, um, I think, Thames Valley, I nearly said home counties, which I think is a bit out of uh, kilter these days, and also a group in, in Yorkshire. Um, but I've never been able to, to say he had an affinity of X people, you know, these people who know that um, Roger Bigod had a, an affinity of 12 nights or something. I've never been able to see that because I think they're changing all the time. There is a solid core. And of course he has a, uh, a solid core of clerks who look after him too. Michael of Northampton and so on. And he inherited Michael from Richard, right? He did, yes. Yeah. Is this a, a feudal or non-feudal affinity? I mean, uh, what's the mix? I know it's been studied by Andrew Spencer, but what's the mix? I think it, 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 is, it is a mix. I mean, some of them from the, Cor the Cornish ones are almost all holding land from him. But when you get into the um, Midlands and so on, I think that they're not all for his tenants. Hmm. Uh, quite a lot from the honour of Wallingford, are there? Yes, yes. Wallingford, he had the honour of Wallingford, Birkenstead and St. Valerie. Yeah. And of course he had two outliers. He had the Isleworth thing that was mentioned earlier on in Middlesex, but he also had Shoreham in Sussex, which is, you know, near me. Mm. And I think lands in Chichester too. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, David, since we have you here, I have to ask, when is that second volume yeah. coming? have to have the um it into yale for copy editing at the end of july so it should come out early next sometime next year in the first half of next year wow. i should look pre-order that now david i will do that uh, but anyway i think much more important is we should all look forward and celebrate and buy and give uh, uh michael's book to as many people as we can think of yeah, I was going to mention that everybody should go get their shopping list for the week, scratch out whatever is at number one and get this book. I, I had the, uh, how shall I say, great honor of, uh, of going through it, uh, helping Michael with the index and all that. And I, at first I was thinking, why so much detail? But then that's exactly what we want. We want to know that particular night in that particular county. I mean, this... I, I, I have spent hours looking for little details like that, and it's all here, so. Yes, really I'm afraid there is an awful lot of detail, how much was spent on a bit of corn and things like yeah, that. Yeah, but that, that's fascinating. I mean, it's a little bit like um, uh, Louise Wilkinson's book here. I'm sure all of you have this. I mean, I was absolutely stunned when I got this book because first of all, she provides, um, you know, the, the Latin and, the, and a translation for you of the accounts of Eleanor de Montfort, but how she spends half the book explaining all this, putting it all in context. What does it mean when you spend so much money for a barrel of corn or whatever, or all the beer that you have to buy for the garrison? So, so I, really. think it's a, I think it's a brilliant book. One thing I didn't mention is that um, when Edmund was in prison, uh, Countess Eleanor, his aunt, was very kind to him, sent him gifts and so on. And we know that from Louise's book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they even had um, the ermine fur made for yeah. Pentecost because Richard, you know, Richard had to dress well for every holiday. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> you know, take care of the older brother. Yeah. Well, she, she gave them clothes. Uh, Simon and Mumford put them in irons. So, you know, <laughs> slightly different approach. Well, you know, this is a question that uh, I asked myself uh, with, with Richard was more or less that it seems to me that Simon tried to erase all presence of Richard and Edmund. I mean, they were just gone during his regime. Now, of course, Henry of Almain, he employed on missions to France and all that stuff. But I, I really get the impression that he wanted Richard to disappear just so he could get a hold of all that land and property. I mean, it was just money flowing into the regime coffers. King that the, Don's... that uh, Edmund's wife, her brother, Thomas, was the man who helped the Lord Edward escape at Hereford. Yeah, the inside you know, agent. The Battle of Asian. It, in some ways, it, the whole thing was uh, a huge sort of uh, soap opera, wasn't it, really, of, uh, of, of great proportions, uh, you know, big family quarrels. And uh, the interplay between all these sort of people, I'm sure, and they were all so powerful, was 
going to be such an important um, side of the the whole um, saga of the Barons' War and, and what happened afterwards. Yeah, I mean, and it's uh, something that needs to be explored more in details is the fact that here you have a family saga that is starting decades before the ultimate crisis. I mean, Henry and Simon fell out 25 years before the ultimate break happened. I mean, it's, it's quite a long time. And when you when you read these brief histories, it's just like, oh, you know, there's some, you know, rebellion just came out of nowhere. That leads me to a, just, I, I don't know if I've allowed one more question. Um, Michael, um, uh, you know, Edmund died, didn't he, uh, before um, uh, Edward I died? I, I, ne I never said when he died, did I? No, but not to worry. <laughs> ah, but uh, it was about 1300, wasn't it, or something yeah, like 13, that? Yeah, October 1300. That's right. But I just wanted to know, what do you think he would have made of Edward II? <laughs> I... I he was such a sort of straightforward person. I suspect he wouldn't have been too happy with him. But I think Edward II actually came to his funeral. Interesting that the earldom of Cornwall went to Gaveston, didn't it? Mm. Mm, and well, then went back to the royal family, which is still there. I mean, one of my illustrations is the Ashridge Mapper Monday, which is owned by the Duchy of Cornwall. So I had to get permission from, from Prince Charles's people to use it in the book. Sorry, could, could you explain for us quickly how Cornwall came to the monarchy? Um, well, when, when um, Edmund died, the lands went reverted to the king. Right. And then uh, Edward II awarded them to Gaveston. And Gaveston you know, came to a sticky end. And then the next person to have it was Edward II's... Uh, John of Elton, he was... Um, Edward's second son, wasn't he? Yes, yes, second son. And when he died, uh, later the Black Prince was the next one to have the Duchy of Cornwall, and, uh, and that's why they've kept it ever since. All right. And from the Black Prince, it went to Richard the Second, and then yeah, it's still all just follow the line, you know. Right. Okay. How did your family end up in Chester? Uh, my uh, they my parents met in in the Liverpool area. My mother lived in a place called the Wirral, which is the other side of the Mersey from Liverpool. And I think when they married, they just were looking for somewhere local. So Chester was the nearest place. So they they were there. And then when the war broke out, my father went into the army, and off they went to stay with with grandfather. Uh, what did your father do in the army? He was in the um, intelligence course, and then he was in the SOE, uh, working with the Danish resistance. And um, there's a, big, a recent book by Pen and Sword on the Danish resistance and SOE has him in it. You know, so it's quite interesting that he was spent most of the latter part of the year in Stockholm liaising with the in, in resistance. He was the first English officer into Denmark at the end of the war. Well, really. And how, how long did he spend there? Or... Well, he carried on after the war. He, he worked, worked for Dunlop in Copenhagen, but by that time the marriage had broken up, and so I know, have no real memories of him. And we moved to Shropshire, you see, and, uh, um, and then from there I went to London and met my lovely wife in London at King's College, oh, reading geography. <laughs> King's College, right, right, yeah. So, and uh, that's that's where you spent your career before medieval studies. Uh, well, no, I was a town planner for thirty six years. You know. And, and where, whereabouts? Well, I ended up in Hove in Sussex, but I worked for the Greater London Council at one time, Surrey, Middlesex, Herefordshire. I moved around a bit and then got stuck here. And and, and this was before PC. So, did you have to use a a slide and a rule and and pencil and all? Well, we, we had a thing called letter set in those days. You know, you had a thing you used to peel off letters onto a, a plan. You didn't have computers, yeah. of course. And, and the plan was like rolled up and stored somewhere yes, and just, right. just like a roll and, of the 13th century, right? And plan chests. Plan they, weren't like chest. the, they weren't like the pipe rolls. No. <laughs> so they, they weren't glued together at the ends? No. <laughs> they were done on linen. Oh, linen, really? Yeah, to, to save them. And if you had some extra ones left over, you should soak them in water and use them as a rag. 
So it's a bit of a long way from Edmund to Cromwell, isn't it? Really, but Lenin, you you could wash them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So did you ever get stuck with the weekly wash at the town planning oh, no. commission? No, no. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, thank you, Michael, for coming. One more time, I will my glass to you. And like I said, uh, best of luck and thank you again for, for being with us and sharing your experience and so forth. So people, thank you for coming. Talk thank to you again you, later. Thank you, Michael.